todas e a todos. Bom dia, gente. Bom dia. Tá fazendo frio, mas vocês não perderam a voz, não. Uma satisfação poder vir à Escola de Engenharia e participar desta atividade. Trata-se de uma das grandes conferências do programa de cátedras do IEAT, IEP. É, eu vou ser bem breve, eu queria destacar é, que essa atividade, ela se integra no conjunto das atividades que a UFMG vem desenvolvendo ao longo do ano, em comemoração aos seus 90 anos, 90 anos de UFMG. E uma particularidade do IAT de desenvolver atividades que são transversais dentro da universidade. Tá? Dessa forma, eu gostaria de cumprimentar o professor Estevam, aqui ao meu lado, que está à frente do IAT e vem conduzindo esses trabalhos, e toda a equipe do IAT aqui presente, que também dá suporte e apoio a ele. E, de igual maneira, a professora Ângela, que nossa anfitriã, que mantém relações e, de certa forma, convidou o professor David Love para fazer a palestra deste dia. Eu, antes de passar a palavra ao professor Estevam, eu quero externar os nossos agradecimentos ao nosso convidado. Eu vou pedir permissão a vocês de me dirigir a ele na própria língua dele, em inglês. E, dessa forma, agradecer em nome da Universidade é, a presença dele e a vinda dele ao nosso, é, ao nosso campus e ao FMG. Professor David, thank, thank you for accepting our invitation, for making the effort to travel from your country. If I'm not wrong, today is the Independence Day of your country. Um, and to stay with us for this short period, I hope this is the first for of many times that you visit us and I'm sure that we will leave this room after your conference different from we started the day. I'm sure the, the theme of the conference is instigating and will throw light in many fields of investigation in our institution. Thank you very much and on behalf of our institution I thank you for accepting the invitation to come to FNG. Professor Steve. Bom, bom dia a todo mundo. É, eu queria agradecer ao professor dele, ao, ao professor Jaime Ramirez também pela presença, para ele estar sempre prestigiando aqui as atividades da gente, e a Ângela, que foi quem tornou possível esse convite para o professor dele vir aqui. Né? Eu queria também, é, eu sempre, eu, minha função aqui é um pouco de fazer propaganda do IEAT, né? rapidinho e fazer. Né? Então, o, o, o IEAT é o Instituto de Estudos Avançados Transdisciplinares. E a, a ideia da gente é de ser um instrumento da universidade para promover esse tipo de atividades. Né? Então, o semestre que vem, por exemplo, nós já temos umas dez, uns 10 seminários desses sobre temas dos mais diversos programados, e se vocês tiverem tempo uma hora, pode ser até antes ou depois da palestra, dá uma olhadinha no, no site do IAT aí, que, que é para vocês aprenderem o caminho e, e, e se registrarem lá para ficar sendo atualizados sobre as atividades. Né? E eu queria também agradecer que tem o nosso instituto, então tem esse transdisciplinar no, no nome, né, que é meio composto um imponente assim, mas a nossa equipe, além de transdisciplinar, ela é polivalente também, né? Então somos <risos> nós, os funcionários e diretor lá do, do IAT, é, então, são um pouquinho a gente que a, a pobre da, da Aretusa ali foi promovida a, a mestre de cerimônias, né? E que a gente chuta com, com os dois pés aí, em qualquer situação. E, e tenta, tentando tornar esse tipo de iniciativa possível. Né? Mas então, sem demorar mais, eu vou passar para a Ângela para a apresentação do professor David Lobbiger. 
Bem, bom dia a todos. Cumprimento o nosso magnífico reitor, professor Jaime, diretor do IAD, professor Estevam de Las Casas. E, primeiramente, eu gostaria de agradecer a cada um de vocês por estarem aqui presentes, porque é isso que faz esse evento ser possível. Então, obrigado por vocês estarem aqui. E eu gostaria também de deixar bastante claro, destacar a importância do IAT dentro da nossa universidade. O IAT foi fundado no ano de 2002, juntamente com o primeiro curso de pós-graduação em Neurociências, também em 2002. E nós iniciamos dentro da universidade essas atividades interdisciplinares, que são muito importantes para o FMG. E sempre tivemos o apoio da UFMG nesse sentido. E é, eu gostaria de destacar a, essa atual gestão do IAT, que ao longo do tempo o IAT foi crescendo e hoje em dia ele aceita e atua, que eu acho que é muito importante, na área de formação de recursos humanos. Então, quando o IAT se iniciou, nós não tínhamos essas atividades de é, oferta de cursos dentro da proposta do IAD. Isso foi criado pelo professor Estevam. Então, eu gostaria de destacar essas novas atividades que foram desenvolvidas pelo IAD na gestão do professor Estevam de Las Casas. E é, eu também não posso deixar de agradecer a toda a equipe do IAD, aos funcionários técnicos administrativos, a Aretuza Duarte, o Fábio Oliveira, a Jordana de Fátima, a Camila Barros, o Alexandre Antunes. E deixar claro que esse evento ele foi coordenado pelo professor Christopher Kuschmerick, é, do Departamento de Fisiologia do ICB, com o apoio de uma das nossas estudantes do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Neurociências, a Mariana Jacobsen, a quem eu agradeço muito, porque a organização desses eventos realmente demanda um tempo muito grande. Bem, o curso envolve a participação de vários professores, entre eles, eu agradeço também, professor Cleito Aguiar, professor Daniel, doutor Daniel Silva, que está atualmente ex-aluno da UFMG, atualmente está fazendo seu pós-doutorado no NAIT, a Daniela Aguiar, a professora Daniela Aguiar, o professor Fabrício Moreira e a professora Lígia Naves. Bem, é, enfim, I... Finally, <laughs> but uh, also important, I want to once again to thank so much Dr. Lovin for accepting our invitation. And it's an honor to have you here at the, our university. And I invited Dr. Kushmerik to introduce Dr. Lovin and to detail his brilliant career and contributions to the field of neuroscience. Thank you, Dr. Christopher, please. Uh, bom dia, good morning. Uh, I'm going to speak in English to present uh, Dr. Lovinger. It's a great pleasure. Uh, Dr. Lovinger comes from the Laboratory for Integrative Neurosciences at the National Institutes of Health in Washington, near Washington, D.C. Dr. Lovinger earned his undergraduate degree in psychology from the University of Arizona. And from there, he moved northeast to the Northwestern University in Chicago, uh, where he earned his master's degree and his PhD in psychology and behavioral neurobiology uh, under the orientation of Dr. Rotenberg, who studied under Dr. Olds, who studied under Donald Hebbs, uh, just to give an idea of the, the, the line. Uh, in 1987, uh, Dr. Lovinger left Northeastern University, Northwestern University, and moved to the NIH, where he did a postdoc, postdoctoral study under the supervision of Dr. Forrest Waite. At the NIH, Dr. Lovinger made a series of discovery, discoveries related to NMDA and GABA receptors in sensory neurons in the hippocampus, uh, with many of these studies related to the effects of ethanol, alcohol, on receptor function. 
After finishing his postdoc at NIH, Dr. Lovinger took a faculty position at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee in the departments of physiology and biophysics and in the department of pharmacology, both in the School of Medicine. Uh, at Vanderbilt, he earned uh, tenure and then became a full professor, and his laboratory worked on many aspects of neuronal excitability, synaptic plasticity, and neurotransmission, but he, re he retained his interest uh, uh, on the effects of ethanol on receptor function. In 2002, Dr. Lovinger was invited to return back to the NIH, and at present, he is a tenured investigator at the, at, at the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, head of the Laboratory of Integrative Neuroscience and of the Section on Synaptic Plasticity. His laboratory uses electrophysiology and optogenetics to continue his research interests on the effect of ethanol on the nervous system, as well as many other areas of neuroscience. So it's a great pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Lovinger uh, to present him for us. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for this very kind welcome. And um, I can see the, the screen from here. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the director. I would like to thank Professor Las Casas, and Professor Ribeiro, and Merrick, and everyone involved here, and the Diaz, uh, who are a wonderful welcome, and I've had a chance to visit and see many of the great students here, and already hear about some exciting research. So I hope I can tell you about the work that we find exciting in our own laboratory. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is one aspect of how alcohol and cannabinoids cannabinoid drugs affect the nervous system and their <coughs> impact on certain aspects of behavior that is fostered by long-term alcohol or cannabinoid use. And and while I won't be able to cover the entire spectrum, the entire types of effects that these drugs have on the nervous system, I hope I can at least introduce you to the scope of the problem and then tell you about specific aspects and try to relate those to other drug effects. So I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, it will be a mix of introduction and experimental data. So this is our laboratory where Dr. Rivero is presently visiting and doing some really exciting work. Um, and what I'm going to focus on is mostly this idea of habit, habitual behavior, and how habits are affected by drugs of abuse. When we consider what drugs of abuse do to the nervous system, it is a huge problem. Taking this, the circuitry involved within the human brain in the acute effects of alcohol and the addictive effects of alcohol, you can see that this involves almost the entire forebrain, the cerebrum of, of the human. And I've just taken this slide from our institute director, Dr. Koo, to show you that usually drug addiction or drug abuse problems proceed in stages with initial taking of the drug, often intoxication and uncontrolled intake. And one thing I always want to stress is that you need to know the effects of the drug to understand how intoxication works, because each drug is a little bit different. With heavy use, often you will proceed to this uncontrolled intake, and then often humans will try to stop taking the drug. And then they'll encounter problems of abstinence and withdrawal. And then with time, they'll become maybe preoccupied with taking the drug again and cycle right back into this uncontrolled intake. And often after relapsing, the control of the intake is even worse than it was before the abstinence. So what Dr. Koop has done here is break down some of the different circuitry involved. I'm not sure I agree completely with this, but this blue part here is the part I'm going to be focusing on, which we think is involved in the uncontrolled aspects of drinking. But there are also very important parts of the brain, like the limbic circuitry, that are involved in the negative consequences of trying to stop drink that often drive relapse. And there are parts like the prefrontal cortices 
that are involved in this sort of preoccupation, this thinking about taking the drug that leads to relapse. And of course, we're going to focus mostly on the rodent brain today. So I'm just going to point out here, I'm going to be talking a lot about the connections between the cerebral cortex and different areas of the cerebral cortex and this green structure here, the dorsal striatum. And it can be separated, as I'll show you, into two regions, the dorsal medial striatum, which is part of an associative circuit, the equivalent of the human caudate nucleus, and the dorsal lateral striatum, which is a part of a sensory motor network that controls uh, motions and actions, and that is equivalent to the human cutamen nucleus. So this is the, mostly the structures I'll be focusing on for this lecture. Oh. I also want to discuss how we choose to look at animal models of addiction, because in the laboratory, of course, we can only do limited studies with humans, and they do that at NIAAA or at NIH. But we choose to use animal models. And of course, the brain of a monkey is quite a bit less complex than that of a human. The brain of a mouse is really small and very, very less complex than that of a human. But at the same time, it contains many of the same key cortical and subcortical regions. But we have to remember that we will not be able to completely model or get all of the phenotypes of addiction that you see in the human using a mouse model. So the, pro the approach that we favor is to try to find phenotypes, behaviors, circuit changes, things like that, that resemble those things that go on in humans. Not try to find every aspect of addiction in one animal model, but to try to find the key circuits that are involved in these key phenotypes, and then try to parse out what are the mechanisms that are involved in the effects of the drugs. So we want to have appropriate drug concentrations used in our experiments. We want to have self-administration of drugs at levels as close as possible to what we can get in humans. And I'll talk more about that when I talk about some of our non-human primate work. We want to have measurement of drug-related phenotypes that are meaningful for human studies. That is, we want to look at things like withdrawal, like seeking of alcohol, cognitive changes with alcohol that happen in humans and try to see as best as we can what happens in animals. We want to perform, especially in these smaller organisms, circuit analysis or genetic manipulation. That is, we hope that by delving into the brain, we can understand what changes in the circuit with exposure to drugs and with abstinence and with long-term uh, drinking. And hopefully that will tell us about something that happens in humans which we can't study easily. We want to have patterns of social behavior and stress responses. And of course, we always have to bear in mind pharmacokinetics and metabolism. And one thing about a mouse is that it, it metabolizes drugs faster than rats or humans. So that's always something to bear in mind. So this is just an idea for those of you who want to use animal models in addiction research of the factors you need to take into account. So what I'm going to focus on today is the circuitry that I spoke about a little earlier. And I want to point out that the cortical basal ganglia circuit have really three parallel sub-circuits within them. There is an associative circuit that involves things like the orbital frontal cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex that connects to the dorsal medial striatum that can influence behaviors that we usually think of as conscious behaviors or sometimes goal-directed behaviors. So that is, behaviors that are done for a purpose that are, you're paying very close attention. There is also this sensory motor circuit that I mentioned that involves sensory motor cortices like your, your primary motor and primary sensory cortices projecting to the dorsal lateral striatum, which is a part of the striatum that is involved not only in coordinating many of your actions or initiating many of your actions, but also doing so unconsciously. That is actions that you perform every day that you don't even think about. And this is important that you have these two circuits working in conjunction so that you can modify your behavior appropriately. This third limbic circuit that involves many of the older parts of the cortex and things like the hippocampus and amygdala projecting into this ventral striatum or nucleus accumbens circuit. I won't talk about as much today, but it's very important for addiction. Lots of people study it. Dr. Silva is studying it. And it has a, a key role in linking emotions to drug use, including the negative consequences of stopping drinking 
and how that leads to relapse. And that's a great topic that I think you'll hear more about as time goes on. But I also want to stress that one of the effects of drugs of abuse, especially of alcohol, is to <coughs> sort of uncouple this circuit, this uh, associative circuit, to dampen down the cortical components of that and its control of behavior. And when that happens, it leads to cognitive impairment, as I'll show you, but also leads to what we call habit formation. That is, when this part of the circuit takes over, you start to do things more habitually, more automatically. And of course, when, when there's a shift due to drugs into this circuit, you tend to have more control by emotions. And the thing that suffers as a consequence is your ability to use your executive functions to make decisions. And I hope I'll show you some experimental evidence for that and what goes on in the circuit. So we can think of the role of this dorsal stratum or uh, associated and sensory motor circuit in this way. Um, you need to learn new actions, and for example, my grandson here, learning to ride a bike, he's paying very close attention to everything he does. He's watching, he's careful about the consequences. My son here is so good at riding a bike, he can think about other things and look at other things while he's riding a bike. He doesn't even have to pay attention to the actions. So this is what this circuitry does. It pushes actions from being conscious to being unconscious, so that you can save a lot of your intellectual energy for doing new things. And of course, if you're a really good player like this guy, some of you about my age may remember this guy. He was a great soccer player, and he could perform these goal-directed and habitual actions in tandem and switch between them and score goals, sometimes with his hands, I think. And he, so you use this system to make perfect these behavioral actions. And you can switch between goal-directed and habitual actions under normal circumstances, and that's very adaptive for a male. You can also learn new actions. The trouble is when things go wrong with this thing, and when drugs and booze push you towards these things going wrong, sometimes you develop habits that you really shouldn't. And sometimes this sensory motor circuit will take over and lead to excessive behavior of that. And that's really what we think these circuits do. So our approach to this problem is to look at, as much as we can, the molecules and the synapses involved in these types of changes by using techniques where we can expose to drugs but also measure single cell responses and look at the roles of single proteins that I'll talk about, up through this sort of micro-circuit and circuit level where we can use older techniques like electrophysiology but also newer techniques like opto and chemogenetics to manipulate this circuitry and the small parts of the circuitry to see what goes on there. And ultimately look at the behavior of this guy here and use some techniques uh, to manipulate circuits, to measure circuit functions, and of course to give drugs. And throughout all these areas of research, we're trying to do genetic manipulations to change uh, what's going on in the animal's brain by changing the expression of proteins in the brain. And we try to go both ways in this pathway. We try to go from the cellular things we find in, in cells and in slices, brain slices, back up to the organism, or behaviors that we find that we want to try to explain by looking at what molecules and circuits might be involved. So that's our general philosophy. So one of the behavioral paradigms that I'll talk about the most today <coughs> is this habit formation instrumental conditioning paradigm. And it's sort of similar to the work that B.F. Skinner and Konorsky and others developed uh, way back in the early parts of experimental psychology. So the task that we have the mouse do is we put it in a box and we teach it to press a lever and when it presses this lever, it gets food, usually a food pellet or sucrose. And we train the animal to press the lever till it gets very good at it and then it goes back to its home cage and gets all it wants of another type of food, a different type of food. And then we train them with two different training paradigms for those of you who know operant conditioning. One is a random ratio paradigm where the animal just gets rewarded uh, on a stochastic, according to a, a Gaussian distribution, every, when it makes every so many lever presses. And that's a very predictable pattern. So the animal knows it just has to press a lot to get reward. On the other hand, we can train it with a random interval paradigm, and we can actually, in that case, the animal gets rewarded every once in a while, every so often, uh, based on a Gaussian distribution of time, if it makes one lever press. So this fosters a sort of steady rate of lever pressing. 
And we do this to foster two types of behavior. One we'll call goal-directed behavior, one we'll call habit. And the way we <coughs> determine whether we're seeing goal-directed behavior or habit is to do this devaluation or sensory-specific satiety paradigm. And in this paradigm, we will one day give the animal all it wants of the food that it gets for pressing the lever before it even goes into the box. And then it goes into the box, doesn't want this anymore. So if it really values this outcome, it will stop pressing the lever. <coughs> on the value day, the animal should keep pressing the lever because it wants this even though it's gotten that. And that is the truth. That's what happens. And it turns out if we train animals on the random ratio schedule, they'll show the evaluation. They'll press more on this day than that day. And you can see that here. But if the animal has been trained in this random interval paradigm, it will press approximately equally on both days because the outcome really doesn't matter much to the animal anymore. It's been trained to sort of disregard the value and just understand that when it's in that context, it should press that level. And this is the sort of uncontrolled, unconscious action that we're seeking to study. And in fact, Tina Gremmel, when she was in the lab with Rui Costa in our group, found that you can train animals in two dip slightly different contexts on the same day with using these two schedules, and you can actually get this kind of behavior, which actually came from these experiments, in the same animal on the same day, just by putting it in two different contexts, two different boxes. So this really shows that the context in which the animal performs the action is very important. Its expectancy of what's going to happen in that environment is very important for controlling that behavior. So I'm going to turn to talking about how this behavior is affected by ethanol. And I want to just point out that ethanol is a big problem in a lot of societies. Um, it certainly has a lot of intoxicating motor impairing effects. There are huge problems in the United States with alcohol consumption, with alcohol use disorders. And if you want, you can try to find your country on this map and see that it's probably not at the top of the scale. And ours in the United States is probably not at the top of the scale of the worst drinkers. But certainly there are lots of problems in both. So how does ethanol affect the brain? There are a lot of basic work we've done and others to show the primary target. What I'm going to focus on today is how ethanol promotes habit formation and the circuits that might be, or some of the mechanisms involved in that. <coughs> and some of the things. There we go. So one way in which we can get animals exposed to alcohol and start to affect their brain is by putting them into a chamber where they'll be exposed to alcohol to produce blood alcohol concentrations that are more than <coughs> legal intoxication, that are pretty high concentrations that will get the animals drunk early and, and they'll remain intoxicated almost throughout this procedure. We can put them in these enclosures for uh, four days a week and then give them three days off, a little bit of abstinence, put them back in again let them dry out again. And then at the end of this, we can do various types of experiments. We can either take brain slices from these animals and look at the physiology, or we can look at behavior, which is what I'll show you next. And we can also do controls that are in the chambers but don't get the other. And we'll do this from anywhere from two to four weeks of exposure. And in that way, we can ensure they get a certain concentration of alcohol, and it's chronic alcohol, and we can see what that does for people. So, you remember this goal-directed versus habit paradigm that I showed you. But one of the things that Tina Gremmel noticed in the lab with her technique, and I'll just focus on this part here, is that when she had these animals trained in this random random ratio or random interval schedule compartment, the normal animals that get air will show habitual behavior, that is no decrease in lever pressing when it's devalued in the random interval. In the random ratio, they show this devaluation. But the ethanol-exposed animals, regardless of how they're trained, regardless of the context they're in, don't show devaluation. It's as if they become habitual faster. They just develop this habit of lever pressing, regardless of the context, <coughs> due to this alcohol exposure. And we aren't the only ones who've seen this. Um, and I'll point out some of the data from, for example, Corbett's lab. So several labs have seen the same kind of thing. Uh, but I should also point out some work from the Holmes Laboratory at NIAAA, in which we particip participated. It also shows that animals will more readily learn a touch screen task, where they poke a screen, if that part of the task 
involves the dorsal striatum, the sensory motor circuit that I talked about. That will be enhanced by chronic alcohol exposure. So it seems like chronic alcohol exposure fosters the use of the <coughs> sensory motor circuit, maybe at the expense of the associative circuit. So one example I wanted to show you here is from the work of uh, Corbett and Janik, where in this case, instead of using food as the reward and showing the sort of cognitive changes that we showed or the habit formation for food, they also did the same sort of experiment for alcohol. So in this case, the animal would lever press to get alcohol, then you would give it all the alcohol it cared to drink before going into the session, and then test to see if it would still press for alcohol after that. And with that sort of similar paradigm with alcohol, what they show is that, of course, the animals at the start of training are goal-directed. If you train them for eight weeks, in this case using a ratio paradigm, it's for over-training them, training them for a long time so that they start to learn the thing as a habit. They show no devaluation, so they look very habitual <coughs> here. And what they did was to inactivate two parts of the striatum, the dorsal lateral striatum or the dorsal medial striatum, just by injecting drugs uh, that will uh, enhance gabaritic transmission into these different regions and sort of shut them down. And so when they did that and they shut down the dorsal medial striatum, it really, it, it really fosters this habitual responding, even at the two week period. <coughs> so that fits with the idea that the dorsal medial striatum is part of a circuit that controls goal directed behavior. If they shut down the lateral striatum early in training, they got pretty much the same thing, maybe even more goal directedness, more evaluation. But eight weeks into the task, shutting down the dorsal lateral striatum really, or dorsal medial striatum, really didn't do much of anything. The animals were still habitual. But if you shut down the dorsal lateral striatum, you could take these animals that were pressing in a habitual manner, decrease their pressing, and actually show evidence of this devaluation even after the animals were trained for a long period of time. So this tells us two important things. One, of course, is that the dorsal lateral striatum really is involved in this behavior, this habitual behavior, this goal insensitive behavior. But it also shows you that you could recover. If you get this sensory motor circuit, this dorsal lateral striatum inactivated, you could actually restore goal directed behavior and maybe conscious decision making. So that gives us hope that maybe we could treat humans in some way to either promote this circuit or uh, to try to turn off this circuit to, to restore normal decision. Um, and it also shows you the roles of these different regions. Uh, this can also be done with other paradigms like lithium chloride devaluation that makes the animal sick when they take the drug or random reward presentation. This has also been done in humans. So in humans, uh, Shorts et al., Gladman and others, uh, several laboratories have now shown that humans who drink a lot of alcohol will show very habitual type behavior in computer pressing tasks for visual reward. So this sort of cognitive impairment or fostering of uh, habitual behavior happens in humans as well. And in fact, imaging studies, and these are a little hard to see, so I'll just give you the bottom line. Uh, when the animal, when the humans are learning early, they have activation of prefrontal areas. Um, and, and the normal humans show this quite prominently while they're doing these sort of computer pressing tasks. Um, they're very goal directed in their behavior. But animal or humans that have drunk a lot of alcohol become habitual in the task, and that's accompanied by activation of the putamen region. It's a little hard to see in here because the, the, the little voxels aren't showing up, but basically they see less activation of the prefrontal cortex and more activation of the putamen while they're performing the task. So this is once again consistent with this idea that even in the humans, this sensory motor circuit becomes overactive and overengaged, and the associative circuit turns off after chronic alcohol exposure. So the, I'll show you just evidence from one of the mechanisms we think is involved in this overactivation of part of the striatum uh, after chronic alcohol exposure. And it involves one of my favorite types of receptors, and the, these are G-protein coupled receptors that are presynaptic. So these receptors 
bind to neurotransmitters and activate G proteins that, in this case, couple to the G, or these are GIO type G proteins. And the G protein subunits liberated from these uh, activation of these G proteins can either inhibit voltage gated calcium channels or inhibit adenyl cyclase and activate many pathways that lead to either short term or long term depression of synaptic transmission. And we focused a lot on this long term depression that I'll show you some examples of. And it can be activated by a number of receptors. I'm going to talk mostly about the metabotropic glutamate receptor type 2, which is at cortical striatal synapses, and also at the CD1 cannabinoid receptor. And that'll be the focus of the second part of the data that I'll show you. And the first part focuses on these alcohol preferring rats. These were rats who were developed by <coughs> King Lee and his colleagues. And they're animals that will drink a lot of alcohol in a variety of paradigms. And they're operantly self-administer alcohol. And there's uh, data coming online now that they will do so habitually. They'll drink to intoxication. They show withdrawal. They show increased drinking after these withdrawal periods or abstinence periods. Um, and there are non-alcohol phenotypes as well. They have a strong <coughs> preference for sucrose, stronger than other rat types. They were made by selective breeding. There's another animal called the non-preferring rat that doesn't seek alcohol or sucrose to its greatest extent. And it turns out that these P rats are also more sort of uh, impulsive than the NP rats. So along with my colleagues David Goldman and Marcus Heilig at NIAAA, he's now at Lynn Chirping in Sweden, um, David actually sequenced chromosome and found that there's a premature stop codon in MGLAR2 in these alcohol-preferring rats, so that they don't have MGLAR2, they actually don't express it. And this turns out to be a remnant of their breeding in a uh, Wistar strain that started in Hanover, Germany, where a certain percentage of these animals had this premature stop codon, and it was actually bred into these animals, and the selective breeding actually selected for that. So that all the preferring rats have MGLAR2, or non-preferring rats have MGLAR2, but all the preferring rats lack it, as shown here in this western plot. So it's really a functional knockout of MGLAR2. There are also other genetic changes, and this change, as well as some of the others, affect alcohol free, or contribute to the alcohol so our part of this study was to look at electrophysiological changes in the striatum <coughs> of these animals to make sure that MGLR2 was missing, and also to compare these data to MGLR2 knockout lines. And the way that we do a lot of our electrophysiology in brain slices in the striatum taken from a mouse or a rat, we can stimulate afferent fibers, for example, coming from the cortex, that can activate these field potentials. We measure this N2 component with this a synaptically driven uh, population spike, or we can do whole cell recording and measure the glutamatergic excitatory postsynaptic current. And so when we do these sort of experiments and we apply an agonist, a, a drug that activates MGLR2, for a very short period, you can see that in uh, normal hippocampus or striatum, we get this long lasting decrease in this synaptic response driven by cortical afferents in this case. And this is largely missing in the striatum and totally missing in the hippocampus of these P rats. So they do seem to have a functional either great knockdown or knockout of MGLR2. And in fact, if we take mice that are genetically engineered to lack MGLR2, we get this same loss of this effect. So this suggests that this presynaptic depression, this long-lasting depression, is mediated by MGLR2 at this cortical striatal synapse, as well as some other synapses. So the question is, what is the influence of this on drink? And so I'm showing you two paradigms. This is mostly work from Dr. Heilig's lab, showing, first of all, alcohol consumption at different concentrations of alcohol, in this case, in the knockout mouse. So we're just here manipulating MGLR2, independent of some of these other changes you see in the P-Rat. And you can see that they show increased drinking, especially at these higher alcohol concentrations, and they also prefer alcohol over water or to a greater extent in these knockouts than in the wild types. And what you can really see is that the concentration of alcohol goes up. These animals will keep drinking, whereas the, the control animals will curtail their drinking and their preference. But this isn't just a taste change, because we don't think they have any change in their preference for various taste compounds 
and we couldn't see any condition taste aversion to alcohol. They also didn't differ in the metabolism of alcohol, so they get the same levels of alcohol when we explicitly give them alcohol, and their loss of writing reflex, a measure of intoxication, isn't changed. So the change is really something we think about the, maybe the negative consequences in the nervous system of the drinking, that they can keep drinking despite these negative consequences. And that might have something to do with habitual behavior. So what we know, however, that humans don't lack MGLR2. They haven't yet found, except maybe one human that has any sort of mutation that would disrupt the receptor. But there might be other mutations that, that change the receptor subtly. But the other question is whether chronic alcohol exposure itself alters the function of MGLR2. And that's what Kerry Johnson has been looking at in our lab, a postdoctoral fellow. And she applies this agonist, in this case in mouse, looking at the corticostriatal synapses. She applies a MGLR2 agonist, and she can see this long-term depression of transmission that greatly outlasts the agonist exposure. For those of you who uh, like electrophysiology and, and synaptic analysis, this is accompanied by an increase in the paired pulse ratio when we give two electrical stimuli, actually two EPSCs, and when this goes up, it's generally a sign of a presynaptic depression. So then Kerry wondered what happens after we expose the animals to this vapor exposure with alcohol. Does this MRP function <coughs> change? And it does, but in an interesting and kind of subtle way. So in the normal air control animals, we still see this long-lasting depression <coughs> shown in this open circle here. But in this chronic alcohol exposed animals, we still see an initial depression of transmission, but that actually recovers to baseline much faster than in the air associated controls. So we think this has something to do with a loss of the signaling inside the terminal that is responsible for this long-lasting depression. So it sort of is removing this break on glutamatergic transmission. I'll talk about that a little more later. Um, but acute ethanol doesn't have this kind of effect. So it's not the ethanol being there itself. It is the chronic exposure and the adaptation probably in the receptor or the presynaptic signaling mechanisms that lead to this. Interestingly, if we use a positive allosteric modulator along with the agonist, so this is something that will boost, boost the receptor efficacy a bit when it's present along with the agonist, we can actually fully restore this long-term depression, this long-term decrease in synaptic efficacy, uh, even after alcohol exposure. So what we're very interested in now, and I'll mention a few other studies with other drugs, is the possibility that this positive allosteric modulator could be used to alter alcohol effects in alcohol drinking in vivo. Um, there is precedent from the work of um, Wolfgang Sommer and colleagues, this paper Meinhardt et al, in thinking that MGLR2 might be able to control drinking. And this is some of their studies where they get rats in this case, this chronic exposure to alcohol, and they show that after, very similar to what we use, after this chronic exposure to alcohol, these rats will start drinking higher levels of alcohol than they would if they'd never been exposed. And what they see is generally an increase in glutamate levels within the nucleus accumbens part of the striatum after this chronic alcohol exposure. And it becomes resistant. Normally, in the control animals, you can depress this glutamate level by giving this MGLR2-3 agonist. But you can't in the chronically exposed animal. <coughs> so once again, something going wrong with this receptor. But here is shown in vivo in a cortical striatum pathway. And what they've shown that I think is very interesting is that if they restore the MGLR2-3 expression using a viral technique, they boost the levels of MGLR2 in this uh, infralimbic part of the prefrontal cortex, they can actually change the drinking behavior of the animals. So the normal control animals will show some drinking, but uh, increasing MGLR2 really doesn't change that very much. But these chronic alcohol exposed animals drink more than the controls. And in fact, you can restore the alcohol drinking to the normal levels that you see in the control animals by giving this, uh, by giving this extra MGLUR expression into the infralimbic cortex. But of course, we're not going to probably be able to put viruses in human brains. So we really would like to, to try this sort of PAM related or positive allosteric modulated related approach. I just want to mention, and I'll talk more in the second part of my talk about, or the later part of my talk about this receptor. This is the, the cannabinoid CB1 receptor. 
It's activated by um, lipid metabolites in your brain, and I'll show you in a little bit. Um, this is also a presynaptic GIO coupled receptor that has the same cellular effectors as MMR2. It's expressed strongly in the stridum. And in fact, we uh, characterize a type of long-term depression in the stridum that involves this receptor and involves retrograde signaling that I know Chris is very familiar with and has studied at other synapses, um, where activation, strong glutamatergic activation of a postsynaptic element of the neuron will produce an endocannabinoid that will then travel retrogradely backwards across the synapse to act on the CD1 receptor and will actually lead to a long-lasting decrease in transmission or the release of glutamate at these corticostridal synapses. And we know it's, it, it is, in this case, the only glutamatergic synapses activated or affected are the corticostridal synapses. It involves a lot of, a lot of other mechanisms that I don't have time to talk about that, that are very interesting, including MUR receptors and dopamine. But suffice it to say that when we activate this pathway, we can get endocannabinoid release, we can depress transmission via that mechanism. And chronic alcohol exposure also gets rid of this type of long-term <coughs> synaptic depression, as shown here in some work we did with um, Andrew Holmes and his lab. Basically, we can repeatedly induce this type of depression and get it fairly stable after many periods of high-frequency afferent stimulation. And this is gone in the chronic alcohol exposed animals. And this was also shown using other alcohol exposure paradigms, including drinking, and as I'm showing here, gavage in, in various animals. And it's associated with an increase in the endocannabinoid 2-AG, 2-arachidonoglycerol, in the stride. So that suggests that this mechanism for depressing or putting the brakes on transmission is also decreased <coughs> after long-term alcohol exposure. And in fact, this is a common effect of many drugs of abuse. I've shown that chronic alcohol exposure uncouples MUR2 and also uh, CD1 receptors from producing this type of depression. The Lodge Laboratory has followed up or also worked on this mutation in MUR2, and they found a Wistar derived rat that has these. And uh, they have shown where it came from, and they also showed that these animals are actually more, any animals that have this mutation are actually more impulsive than others. And uh, in fact, there's been a lot of work starting from Peter Kalibas' work and more work by Yaveen Shaham and the late Steve Goldberg that these MGLR2 PAMs, these positive allosteric modulators that can boost the signaling through MGLR2, can reduce taking of other drugs like nicotine or opiates. And, um, so we're especially interested in the mechanisms through which drugs of abuse interfere with the signaling by these receptors. Maybe it's at the level of individual receptors, but maybe downstream targets, like adenyl cyclase, a signaling pathway that uh, is involved in cyclic A and P production that seems to be involved in LTD. So our future work is going to focus on that. <coughs> but rodents really don't drink a lot of alcohol. And so we also want to try to look at a model where we can see higher levels of alcohol intake and probe what's going on in the stridal circuitry of these animals. What are the alternatives? Well, one we've turned to with the help of Kathy Grant, who runs a large research program out at the Oregon National Primate Research Center in Oregon in the USA, is this, these drinking monkeys, alcohol drinking monkeys. And she's used both cinnamogus and rhesus macaques and she can train them to drink alcohol by basically exposing them to early to sort of controlled drinking, letting them only drink so much, then allowing them to drink freely 22 hours a day for a year or up to three years, and sometimes interspersing month-long periods of abstinence during this exposure. And so what we can do with these monkeys, first of all, she, used, she gained every type of behavioral, hormonal, brain scanning, pet, uh, all kinds of information for these monkeys while they're alive. She made every effort to use them to the greatest advantage, in addition to looking at all the drinking behavior. Once the monkeys are brought to necropsy in a pre-planned uh, paradigm, then all the tissue they can possibly distribute, they distribute all the DNA, all the RNA, brain regions, lungs, bones, all kinds of things. So we send people out there actually to record from brain slices after they've had various levels of drinking and various times of drinking. And I'm only going to show you one piece 
of information that we gain from these animals, among many, that tells us that this idea that there's this disinhibition of the dorsolateral striatum or decrease in inhibition is also part of, the, of heavy drinking. First of all, I'll just show you one part of the pattern of drinking. These are monkeys that have been drinking for three years, and they're broken up into the phase just before the first forced abstinence, just after that and after the, during phase three after the second forced abstinence. And the one thing you see is even though the monkeys keep drinking pretty strongly throughout the, the paradigm, their blood alcohol concentration actually end up higher in this last phase of drinking on average. And the other thing you see is that while the animals often, this is drinking every day, the amount they drink every day, they'll drink a lot some days and, and drop off other days. They're less consistent in their drinking. After this final absence period, after they've been drinking for about three years, they're actually very stable in their drinking, very regular in their drinking. They'll go into this enclosure and just start drinking. And she has some evidence that this is actually habitual drinking, that it can't be devalued by previous alcohol exposure. And they do so by just going into the paradigm and licking constantly and sort of gulping down the alcohol quickly. So what happens in the stridum of these animals? Well, when we record, in this case, GABAergic transmission, fast GABAergic transmission mediated by GABA receptors, these sort of miniature IPSC, what we see is that the frequency of these miniature IPSCs, that is the interval shown here between IPSCs, or shown in this cumulative probability histogram, actually goes down. And so they're getting less <coughs> synaptic inhibition in the putamen, the equivalent of the dorsolateral stride after alcohol drinking, and a little bit of decrease in the amplitude of these responses as well. But we think it's predominantly a presynaptic loss of either GABAergic synaptic or GABA relief. And this is correlated with the amount of alcohol they drink over their lifetime, or their average daily alcohol. So it seems like the more of the drink, the more they get disinhibited. We also know that the animals, especially the females, but to a certain extent the males, will drink more in their adolescent phase and young adult phase than in the mature adults. And this is something that's seen in humans. The earlier the age of onset, the more drinking you generally see. And there have been various reasons put forward for this. But in these monkeys, we can at least get rid of some of these cultural variables and show that animals who start drinking earlier keep drinking more. And so we wondered what would happen to the GABAergic transmission in these monkeys after this chronic, chronic drinking paradigm. And so what we see are, are sort of two interrelated effects. One is the effect of age itself. That is, the adolescent animals, even the controls, which I'm not showing so much here, show decreased alcohol, uh, decreased GABAergic um, EPSC frequency, and the young adults a bit more, and the mature adults more. When we layer on to that the alcohol drinking, we actually see an even larger decrease in the adolescent uh, gabaergic transmission than in the adults. And if we actually correlate that with the age of onset or the amount of alcohol, you can see that there is a lower frequency at the earlier ages of onset, so they're disinhibited to begin with, and then when they take more alcohol, we actually see less gathered transmission uh, when they reach the final point. So we think these adolescent animals are getting hit by two factors. One is that their gathered synapses within the stridum are immature to begin with, and alcohol keeps it in that immature, disinhibited state, whereas the adults are many more resilient. They have more gathered transmission to begin with, and they maintain it better in the face of alcohol. So all these things I showed you with alcohol are part of a scheme that we think is disinhibition of the dorsal lateral stridum, or in the case of the, the monkey, the putain. And um, it comes in many forms. I've talked to you about this GIO-mediated long-term depression at cortical inputs of the dorsal lateral stridum. That's a, eliminated or largely reduced so that the glutamatergic excitatory drive onto these MSNs becomes stronger. But I've also shown you that there are local GABAergic effects where we use the GABAergic inhib inhibition of these neurons, and that seems to be uh, also driving the excessive activation of this pathway. So that increased habit formation and some of the increased alcohol seeking, we think is because this part of the circuit is actually 
disinhibited and able to respond more strongly to things like context and the availability of alcohol than it normally would. And we think that's one aspect of why there's heavy drinking and heavy drinking after relapse. So I told you I was going to tell you about cannabinoids, and I'll just wrap up with a little bit of data about the endocannabinoid system, sort of talking about a similar theme, but how that promotes habitual behavior and the circuitry involved there, and then how it might play a role in chronic THC effects. So of course, delta-9 THC is the major psychoactive ingredient in these drugs. Uh, cannabidiol is also present. It may have some therapeutic uses. I think I heard something about that yesterday. Very interesting compound. Uh, cannabinoids are the most commonly used illegal drugs in the US, and they're becoming legal, sort of, maybe, depending on who you talk to. Uh, use is widespread among young people, um, but not really taking off right now. It, it's pretty much plateaued right now. The amount of THC in marijuana has increased steadily. Intoxic intoxication includes altered sensation, altered sense of time, mood changes, impaired movement, cognitive difficulties, and some impairment in memory, but also a sort of development of habits that especially center around the cannabinoids and stuff. And there's some evidence for abuse potential, of course, and dependence, but it's less clear than, say, for alcohol, but certainly there seems to be a syndrome of continued seizure. So we want to know how cannabinoids affect the brain. I've already talked about endocannabinoids and the fact that they are major uh, retrograde signalers in the brain. Um, this just shows the entire uh, sort of spectrum of how they can signal in the brain. I don't want to bore you with all the details here, but I'll point out that there are, is two arachidonal glycerol that can be activated in the postsynaptic neuron, as I showed you, can retrogradely signal to the CB1 receptor. There's another endocannabinoid, anandamide, that can do the same sort of thing through a slightly different synthesis pathway. There are enzymes involved in the production of, especially 2-AG, this DAG lipase enzyme, and there are other enzymes that are involved in the degradation of either 2-AG or anandamide that can boost its level in the synapse. And that's mostly what we know about this system right now, other than it can produce synaptic depression, and there's a lot more we'd like to know about it. And one of the things, of course, we'd like to know is how it plays a role in normal brain physiology or in brain physiology induced by challenges like stress or drugs. And so one of the things that Rui Costa found when he was in our group, along with Monica Alario, was that the endocannabinoids, or at least the CD1 receptor that's activated by endocannabinoids, seems to have a role in habit learning using this paradigm that I showed you earlier. And in fact, they showed that if you knock out the CD1 receptors, animals will stay gold directed. They will not develop this habitual type of learning. And um, if you give animals CD1 antagonists throughout training, the same thing happens. They stay very gold directed, don't develop habits. So there's something going on in the circuitry, <coughs> maybe in the cortical striatal system, that has something to do with CD1 and endocannabinoids. And so, of course, this is Rui who introduced us to a lot of these techniques. Christina Gremmel was involved here as well. And this just shows one of the things we know about the circuitry involved in this type of learning. I showed you earlier that goal-directed learning involves the dorsal medial stridum, and habitual behavior involves the dorsal lateral stridum. But goal-directed behavior also seems to depend on orbital frontal cortex, an area that projects to the dorsal medial stridum, part of the prefrontal cortex complex. And in fact, Tina has shown that this seems to code for some sort of value update. That is, the outcome, what the present value of the outcome is to the organism seems to be coded somewhere in the OFC, and maybe it's projections to the DMS. So if you lesion the OFC, animals go from being goal-directed in this random ratio paradigm to looking very fit. So it's another part of the circuit that's involved. So one of the questions that they, they answered in a really elegant paper that involved a lot of in vivo manipulations, <coughs> EFIS, electrophysiology, I mean EFIS, optogenetics, chemogenetics, was that this OFC projections to the dorsal medial stride this associative circuit uh, seems to help control goal-directed behavior and prevent habitual behavior. And when it's shut off, that seems to foster habitual behavior. And it's maybe part of the natural sequel of, uh, of the transition from goal-directed habit behavior. So leashing the OFC, as I showed you, reduces goal-directed behavior and favors habit, inhibiting these OFC to DMS projections with this uh, design and receptor chemogenetic paradigm has the same effect. The firing of OFC neurons and neurons in the DMS 
is usually pretty well correlated during the performance of goal-directed tasks and stronger than that of the DLS under these value conditions. And they used optogenetics to show that if you activated the OFC firing and the OFC, the DMS input, you could actually increase lever pressing under devalued conditions as if the animal thought that there was some value to the, or some outcome that would come, even when you're devalued. So this all suggested that this uh, paradigm, or that this circuitry was involved in maintaining goal directed behavior and maybe shutting it off phosphorus a bit. So we wondered then, especially based on the evidence with these GIO coupled threads, if endocannabinoids and, and CB1 receptor might be a natural part of this process of shutting off goal directed behavior at the OFC DMS synapse, fostering um, habitual behavior. So what Tina did was use a variety of viral based genetic paradigms. We're using, in this case, the CB1 flox mouse that has. Um, where we can knock out the CB1 receptor if we have the Cree recombinase present. And we can deliver the Cree recombinase with virus injected specifically into the orbital frontal cortex. And you can see, we see projections down to the dorsal medial stridum after this injection. And then the Cree should knock out CB1 receptors there. And so we used a variety of different approaches trying to knock it out in all the neurons in the orbital frontal cortex these projection neurons, or trying to knock it out specifically in those neurons that project out of the orbital frontal cortex using this cam kinase creep, which expresses in these projection neurons, but not so much in the interneurons. And we can show that regardless of how we knocked out orbital frontal cortical CB1, the animal showed strong goal-directed behavior regardless of their training condition, and especially in this random interval paradigm. So that suggests that CB1 receptors in the orbital frontal cortex do indeed have some role in maintaining goal-directed behavior. You get rid of them, the animals, uh, or, or in, sorry, CB1 receptors in fostering habitual behavior. If you get rid of the CB1 receptors, the animals stay very goal-directed. But of course, this orbital frontal cortex also projects to the ventral striatum, to the basal lateral amygdala, down to the midbrain itself. And so we wanted to see if this specific projection from OFC to DMS was the one implicated in this behavioral change. So the first thing we had to do was use electrophysiology. This was the only way we could verify that with this dual viral injection paradigm, we could knock out the CB1 receptor. And so in a very complicated experiment that Jessica Chancy did in brain slices, we actually first injected animals in vivo with a FLEP-dependent Cree construct that would allow for expression of the, or knockout of the CB1 receptor in these CB1 flocked animals when it was combined with this flip, so the flip would turn on the Cree. And this was a retrograde virus that could travel from the stratum back to the OFC. We injected it into the dorsal medial stratum. <laughs> injected it, sorry, into the dorsal medial stratum. And this would allow us then to knock out CB1 receptors only in those OFC neurons that project to the dorsal medial stratum. So looking specifically at these pathways with these powerful genetic tools. And we could show if we then used also a channel adoption construct to activate only that synapse in slices, we could activate EPSCs in the slice, we could activate OFC neurons up in the orbital frontal cortex, and we could show that activating the CB1 receptors with a specific agonist would depress transmission in the dorsal medial striatum in the wild type animals, but not in these CB1 flox animals when they receive these viral injections, suggesting that we did indeed knock out CB1 in this path. And indeed, the animals tested in this way showed very strong, strong goal directed behavior when they were tested either in the random interval or random ratio paradigm, suggesting that indeed it's probably the CB1 receptors at this pathway that mediate the shutoff of goal directed behavior. And, and fostering uh, habitual behavior. So what we think happens during goal-directed behavior is these value updating signals coming from the OFC to the dorsal medial striatum are strong. I've got this a little offset, sorry. Uh, they're very strong and they keep the behavior controlled by the value or the present uh, perception of value. But the CB1 receptor with time gets activated by endocannabinoids during the training. We're not sure how that happens yet. 
That shuts down these pathways, and that probably in conjunction with evidence that Henry Yin and others have, have found that this, sorry, this is supposed to be up here in dorsal lateral spread, that strengthening of these pathways fosters the visual. And I just want to mention two other things that are relevant to this. One is uh, Tonini's laboratory in uh, Italy has shown that chronic THC exposure actually fosters habit formation and eliminates this long-term depression that uh, occurs with normally when we activate the synapses. So it seems like activating the receptors at a low level for a long time via THC actually fosters the uh, habit learning as well. And that probably has something to do with prematurely shutting off this OFC pathway. But there may be also mechanisms in the dorsal lateral study. Oddly enough, when we treat animals for a long time with blockers of the enzymes that degrade uh, the endocannabinoids, so we boost endocannabinoid levels by either inhibiting this Fa enzyme or the MAG lipase enzyme, we just have a chronic increase in the ability to produce or maintain high endocannabinoid levels. That has sort of the opposite effect. That seems to keep animals very goal-directed regardless of their training. And so we think that there's a difference between these natural signals that would normally, and disrupting these natural signals that would normally activate the system versus going in there with a drug that chronically produces low levels of receptor activation that, that fosters habit formation. So we think maybe there may be ways to manipulate this circuitry in order to see if we can restore, say, goal-directed behavior in the face of treatments that produce habit. And this, Maybe a little too much here, but basically the final thing I want to show you is just a, um, from a review that Tina Gremmel and I wrote, basically showing that there are a large number of drug effects in both the associative and sensory motor circuits that seem to foster habitual behavior over a wide variety of different drugs of abuse, and they generally seem to involve this sort of shutting off of the associative circuit and disinhibiting the sensory motor circuit. So thank you all for your attention, and I, I welcome any questions. And